We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Well, good morning. It is great to be with you guys today. Uh, w thank you for rolling out the rain for your uh, Arizona visitors. But uh, I'm, I'm grateful to, uh, to Arundel for giving me such an easy sermon series uh, to kick off as well. Is this what you do for all your guest speakers? Uh, but seriously, um, I'm so grateful for Arundel Christian Church. I'm grateful uh, for your partnership uh, with Story Church, even though we're on opposite sides of the country. Uh, the, the partnership that your church has built with ours already has been such a blessing for us. Pastor Matt is on our management team, which is really kind of an advisory board, a board full of wisdom, a board that is encouraging for us, a board that uh, helps provide important accountability for us as leaders. And, and so we're so grateful to have his wisdom, to have your financial support, to have your prayers. If you are a prayer warrior in this room, please pray for Story Church down in Queen Creek, Arizona. We need your uh, prayers before the Lord. And so please keep us in prayer. Uh, before I begin the message this morning, I would like to just pause and pray for a moment, if you would bow with me. Lord, Father, I, I thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning, and I pray that as we continue on in worship, that, that you would allow me to kind of step out of the way and allow your words and your message and your truth uh, to come forth, Lord. Help all of us in the room to have, to have listening ears and soft hearts to hear what you desire us to hear this morning. In your name I pray, amen. Well, this means war, right? We are in a war right now in our world. You look around our country, and we are in a fight. And we're, we're, we're surrounded by so many controversies and so many difficult topics and, and so many things that, that attack us on every side all the time, constantly. And it's so hard, and sometimes we're... We're surrounded and attacked so much that sometimes these, these lies almost start to feel like <laughs> the truth. And so today, as we, as we start this new series, my job, my goal this morning is to really kind of lay a foundation for the series. So that as we, as we are confronted with, with these lies that we ourselves will know how to stand strong in this battle, and so that as we as we desire to share the truth of Christ with those around us, with the, the world that is, is lost and confused, <laughs> that we will have a solid foundation to stand on. And so that's my goal today. We're going to be in the Old Testament this morning. And there's a story of a young man named Gideon. You, you probably have heard of Gideon. If you hadn't, that all, that's all right. But we're going to talk about Gideon this morning. And we're going to learn some lessons from his war that he fought that hopefully will be helpful for us in our war. Now, this is, this is when the Israelites had been taken out of Egypt. They had originally been slaves in Egypt and pulled out by Moses. Moses had led them out to freedom. They had wandered in the desert for 40 years and then entered into the promised land that God had given them. And this was about 1400 year, uh, BC that they entered into the promised land and they entered the promised land. And when they went in, there were already enemies living there. And so they had to drive out the enemies. But even as they drove out all of these different people groups that were against God, as they took over the land and settled the land, there were still people around, enemies around. And what happened was as they settled in the land because there were still enemies around, there were times when God's own people would allow the culture and the beliefs and the religion of their enemies to influence them. And there were times when they were stronger, and there were times when they were weaker, and they would go back and forth, and it was such a struggle. 
It was such a difficult uh, time to, to, to cling to Christ just as it is now. And so uh, where we're going to pick up today is actually about 250 to 300 years after they entered the promised land. So 1150 to 1100 BC. And we're going to be in the book of Judges, and we're going to be in chapter 6 this morning. Book of Judges, chapter 6. And as we pick up with Gideon, the first thing I want uh, you to be thinking about as we look at this story of Gideon is that that as we are in a spiritual battle, our power must come from God. Our power must come from God. And so in Judges, chapter 6, starting in verse 1. It says, the Israelites did evil in the, sight, in the Lord's sight, so the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. These enemy hordes coming in with their livestock and tents were as thick as locusts. And they arrived on droves of camels, too numerous to count. And they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. They were in a desperate time. They'd rejected God, and God had given them over to their enemies. And they'd reached a point where they understood how how grave the crisis was, and so they cried out to the Lord in desperation. (laughs) Folks, in all of this uh, evil surrounding us, in all of these lies surrounding this world, in all of the spiritual attacks that we're facing, are we crying out to the Lord? In desperation? Are you praying prayers to God in desperation, asking God, please be in this situation? God, please be with me in this situation. God, please be with our country. Please be with our world. With everything that we're facing, God, we need you now. (laughs) Are we praying prayers of desperation? And the Israelites, they reach out to God and they say, God, we need you so badly. And so God responds. God responds. In fact, God responds by sending an angel to the young man, Gideon. If we jump down, starting in verse 11, it says, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezar. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Right? And so here's Gideon, and Gideon is down in a wine press. <laughs> and he's threshing his grain, which, 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 side note, a wine press, wine press, isn't designed for threshing grain, if you couldn't pick that up by the name. <laughs> Right? A wine press is for pressing grapes to make into wine. But Gideon is in the wine press because he's afraid. And he's threshing his grain in a secret place so that the Midianites won't take him. They won't come steal the grain from him. And, and the angel appears, and I love his words. He's like, greetings, mighty hero. <laughs> the NIV says, mighty warrior. What a response from the angel. Here's this man counting. He just seems real mighty in this moment, does he? (laughs) Real mighty Gideon hiding out, threshing his grain in a wine press. But this angel comes in, and he comes in with a message for Gideon. And his message is, your people are oppressed. They've been crying out to God, and God has chosen you to be the one to lead your people. He's chosen you to be the one to take a stand. He's chosen you to be the one. And Gideon responds <laughs> in verse 15. Here's Gideon's response. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least 
in my entire family. So the angel comes and says, God's chosen you, and Gideon's response is, why don't you choose somebody else? (laughs) Well, I, I think you made a mistake here. I think you came to the wrong person. And how often do we respond the same way? When we're in a situation and God is calling us to be bold, when we have opportunities to take a stand for Jesus, and we go, God, send somebody else. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's, it's fear of the consequences that holds us back, right? Sometimes it's, it's what, what it could cost us if we take a stand for it. It could cost me my job. It could cost me relationships. It could cost so much more than I'm willing to give up. God, please send somebody else. Sometimes, sometimes it's like Gideon, we don't feel qualified. God, I don't don't know the Bible as well as I should. I don't don't have the right words to say. I'm not really good at at speaking. I'm a shy person naturally. And so we come up with excuses as to why it shouldn't be us. Sometimes, and I, I think this I think this is the worst of all. Sometimes we're just too complacent. We just, we just don't want to deal with it. It's too much effort. It's too much work. Sometimes maybe we don't even recognize. We've been lied to so much by the world around us that we don't even recognize that we're in the middle of a battle. And so Gideon goes, I'm too weak. And God's God's response, I love God's response in verse 16. He says, the Lord said to him, I will be with you. And you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. God's response is, I will be with you. (laughs) And the reason that we can take a stand, the reason that we can be bold in a world that, that is surrounded by evil and, and, and wickedness and lying and be attacked. And, and the reason that we, can take a, that we can stand strong ourselves and that we can be bold in talking to others is because we can recognize that our power doesn't come from ourselves. It comes from God. That God must be the source of our power. And so God... So Gideon decides to accept this challenge, right? And Gideon is willing to go along with God in this battle. And we, we are called to be bold for God. We're called to to take a stand for him like Gideon. In fact, in the book of of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, we see Daniel confronted by another terrifying situation. Daniel's a young man who's in his in a different country than his homeland. He's in a different place. He's surrounded by enemies. He's he's really a captive even though he's got freedom. And the king makes an order that that everyone in the land can only pray to him, the king. And Gideon has a, or excuse me, Daniel has a choice. Daniel chapter 6, starting in verse 10, it says, But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. Imagine giving thanks in that situation. A command goes out, you cannot pray to God, and his response is to go pray a prayer of thanksgiving. Verse 11, and the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king. Oh, excuse me, I'll pause there. Verse 11, I almost read too far. So they found Daniel praying And catch this, asking God for help. Daniel understood 
that he needed God's help. Just like the Israelites who had cried out, who had yelled out to God in desperation saying, we need you. Daniel understood that in the midst of this situation, he needed God's help. And in the midst of a world full of turmoil, in the midst of all of these battles that we are facing, this war that we are in, we have to understand that we need God's help, that our power must come from God. We can't do it on our own. We can't stand without him. We can't speak without him. We need him. And so the first thing is that we need to remember that that our our power must come from God. The second thing that we need to remember is that our battle plans must come from God. (laughs) And so so Daniel starts to go into battle. He gathers together as many men as he can to create an army. And he builds an army of 32,000 men. Right? He gets together his biggest army. But the Midianites have gathered together some of the other uh, uh, countries, nations that are against the Israelites. And they've built an army of 135,000 men. It's more than four to one odds. I know we've got some some military background in the room. and, uh, And if you are in a fight, you guys know this, if you're in a battle, especially a battle with no technology that's hand to hand, numbers are king. So going into a battle four to one odds is not a good thing, right? That's a terrible battle plan. And so Gideon leads his people and he leads his men and they're heading towards the Midianites and God comes to Gideon and says the last thing that Gideon wants to hear, which is, oh, by the way, you have too many men. (laughs) Excuse me, God, what? And so Gideon, based on God's direction, sends home everyone who doesn't want to be there, everyone who's too scared, everyone who's got family at home. And 22,000 men walk away from the battle, leaving him with 10,000, more than 13 to 1 odds. It's one of those things where you look at it and you go, there's no way to win this battle without God. (laughs) It's not possible. It cannot happen. And so Gideon again starts to march and God comes to him again and says, Gideon, you still have Too many men. I always wonder here, what's going on in Gideon's mind? Like, God, have you ever seen a battle before? Like, do you know what's going on here? And so Gideon, based again on God's command, he takes them down to the water. And he has his men drink in a little river. And those who scoop the water in their hand and and drink, he keeps. And those who bend down and lap it up like a dog, he sends home. Some people speculate maybe that was based on awareness. Maybe it was just that's how God told him to divide them. We don't really know. But 9,700 men were sent home. Gideon is left with 300 men against 135,000. These are God-sized odds. You cannot do this without God. This is, in case you can't tell, a terrible battle plan. This is not how you want to go into battle at all. This is awful design. This is terrible strategy. Any military commander in the world will tell you this is not a good strategy going into battle. But it's God's strategy. Well, then Gideon overhears one of his men talking, and his man is telling another soldier about a dream. And in the dream, Gideon is recognizing that the dream is telling this soldier that God is going to take the victory for them. And so Gideon comes up with a battle plan based on his faith in God. And so we go to the book of Judges, chapter 7, starting in verse 15. It says, when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship before the Lord. Then he returned to the Israelite camp and shouted, get up. For the Lord has given you a victory over the Midianite hordes. He divided the 300 men into three groups and gave each man a ram's horn and a clay jar with a torch in it. Then he said to them, keep your eyes on me. When I come to the edge of the camp, do just as I do. As soon as I and those with me blow the ram's horns, blow your horns too, all around the entire camp, and shout, for the Lord and for Gideon. 
right? And so Gideon comes to his soldiers and said, okay, I've come up with the battle plan, guys. I know we're outnumbered. I know that it's looking pretty rough, but my battle plan includes us not drawing our weapons at the beginning, right? This is a good idea, right, guys? <laughs> he says, in fact, this is like the equivalent of an officer coming to his men and saying, hey, guys, why don't, in this battle, we're going to go in, why don't you take a saxophone in one hand and a glow stick in the other, and we're going we're gonna to take these guys on, right? We got them surrounded, all 300 of us, we got them surrounded. This is easy, piece of cake. And that's the battle plan that Gideon comes up with based on his reliance on God. These are terrible battle plans. This is not a strategy anyone would ever choose unless, unless they're trusting in God. And you see, when we face spiritual battles, when we are attacked, when we have to take a stand and be bold and strong for the Lord, we have to do it following God's battle plans and not our own. We have to do it with faith in his leading and not just doing it based on our own strength. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, there's a passage that talks about becoming mature believers and how important it is to become mature believers and how that comes with all of us working together to support each other, teach each other, encourage each other. And at the, at the end of this passage in Ephesians chapter 4, it tells us the benefits, what will happen if we become mature believers. It says, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown around by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with, cli with lies so clever they sound like the truth. When we're mature believers, it allows us to stand strong in the midst of the evil and the lies that swirl around us. Verse 15, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. And here's the deal, folks. Like, <laughs> that, that beginning of that verse 15, speaking the truth in love is so crucial for us as we take a stand for Christ. And here's what I see. This is, this is what I see so often is the church, not, not Arundel Christian, not any specific church, but the church as a whole, believers, many believers as individuals, they swing too far to one side or the other of this balance. And we see people, we see people who, who want to stand for the truth so firmly and so boldly that they just bash people on the heads with their Bible, Right? And they're so willing to speak truth that they mow people down and they just take a, such a strong stand that it ends up driving people further away from Christ. And sometimes it comes from a place of love and it just doesn't feel like it. <laughs> and sometimes I even wonder if we get so strong and so bold if, if it stops coming from a place of love. But then something I've seen growing more and more, especially over, I feel like, the last decade or so, is I've seen so many people, so many churches swinging to the other direction of speaking love, of trying to share Christ's love, but forgetting the truth aspect. And people wanting to just care about people. I just, I just want to love people. I just want people to know that God will love them no matter what they do. And that's true, but that's not the end of the story. That's not all there is. We can't let people wander in the dark in the sake of love. Because if we're honest, that's, that's not actually love, is it? It's not actually loving to let people wander down a sinful path. And so we have to follow God's plan his battle plan of speaking truth and love and finding that balance of knowing when it's time to be bold, when it's time to take a stand, when it's time to speak up, when it's time to take a risk, and knowing when it's time to pull back, of knowing those core important issues that it's worth, it's worth 
being bold and knowing those times when we should show more grace. Those times when, when we can be a little more gentle in our conversations with people. And our battle plans, they must come from God. We must listen to him in every situation, in every discussion, in our own lives as we stand for him. We must, we must take our battle plans from God. So we have, to, we have to remember that our strength comes from God. We have to remember that our battle plans must come from God. We also, we also need to know that our battle begins at home. That our battle begins in our own houses. With us and the decisions we make and the things we put into ourselves and the things that we show we value to those closest to us. Gideon, before he went into battle with the Midianites, if we flip backwards to Judges 6, starting in verse 25, it says, That night the Lord said to Gideon, Take the second bull from your father's herd the one that is seven years old, pull down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Then build an altar to the Lord your God here on this hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully, sacrificing the bull as a burnt offering on the altar, using as fuel the wood of the Asherah pole you cut down. And so before Gideon ever went into battle with the Midianites, <laughs> he had to first start the fight in his own family. He had to first start in his own house. He had to look around and go, what idols do I have here? God said, tear down the idols that your dad has first before you go out and fight that enemy. Guys, we have, we have to fight the battle in our own homes. We have to tear down anything that will stop us from following Christ. We have to push aside anything that will keep us from being faithful to him that will stop us from, from falling into the lies. Like we, we need to stand true, strong, strong in the truth for Christ. And I want to I want to say this, I want to be very clear. If you are a parent right now, if you are a parent right now of kids who are, especially kids who are still in your home, this is crucial for you. In fact, I even want to go a little bit further. If you are a father <laughs> right now of, of, of kids who still live in your home, you have a responsibility. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 22, verse 6, this is a book of, of wisdom from the wisest man who ever lived. It says, direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. This isn't a promise. This isn't a guarantee. Your kids are going to be able to make their own choices. They're not robots. But what this is, is this is a word of wisdom that if you as a parent direct your children in the way they should go from a young age, the chances of them staying on that path grow immensely, vastly, hugely. The chance of them remaining faithful to what you've taught the chance of them recognizing when lies come at them grows immensely. The chance of them being willing to be bold for Christ grows. We have to be taking a stand. Dads, if you're in this room, you are called to be the leader of your household. And that's not about power or authority more than it is about responsibility. It's about responsibility more than anything else. And you have a responsibility to lead your household towards Christ. And you may go, well, I, 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 don't, <laughs> I don't know how to do that. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not a spiritual giant. How can I teach my kids when I don't know myself? That goes back to point number one. But, but it's practical. You take a Bible off the shelf every night and you read a couple verses as a family and you turn to your kids and you say, what do you think about this? It doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to know all the answers. Just start a family discussion about the Bible. 
when something happens in your house, when, when things are going on, when you have a friend who's going through some struggles, gather everybody together and just pray. Lead a prayer with your family. Because you're not only asking God to step into a situation, but you're setting an example for your kids of where to go for trouble when trouble happens. When you gather for meals or at bedtime, turn to your kid and say, hey, would you pray for us? Give them the opportunity to speak to God. Dads, we got to step up. If you're, if you're a mom in here who has kids who's still at home, you're not off the hook. <laughs> you're responsible too. You have a responsibility if you're a single parent in the room, or maybe you're a parent who's a Jesus follower and your spouse isn't, you're in this battle alone, but God is still with you. You have a responsibility to raise your children on the right path. We have to have the difficult conversations. Don't let somebody else take care of it. Guys, our kids are being attacked on all sides, social media, at school, on TV, everywhere they go. They're being attacked with lies and falsehoods. And they only, the only, the best place that they can hear the truth is from you. You need to speak the truth in your own kids' lives. You need people around you. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy Chapter 11, starting in verse 18. It says, So commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these words of mine. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so that as long as the sky remains above the earth, you and your children may flourish in the land God, the Lord, swore to give your ancestors. And so this is a promise for the Jews about their land, but this is also a word of wisdom for us. That we, as we go through life, everywhere we go, every place in our house, we need to have a focus on Christ. Every conversation we have, we should be having regular conversations about Jesus and the truth of Jesus with our kids, with our family, with our friends. Everybody should know who we are and what we're all about. The Jews took this very literally. They put scripture like literally on their hands and their heads and on their door frames and their houses. Maybe that's what we need to do. But we need to be about Christ everywhere we go. And more than, more than anywhere else with our kids. Again, if you have kids, have real conversations with your kids. Talk about the Bible with your children. Let them see you reading it on your own. Have discussions with them about it, about God's word. Find out what they know. Share with them what you know. Whether it's a little or a lot, it's going to make a difference. Have conversations about real life issues. Talk about things like things that we call political issues that are actually not political issues. <laughs> that are moral issues, right? One of the ones that's closest to my heart is the issue of abortion. This is, a, this is an issue about the value of human life that is created in the image of God. And that's being attacked and we're being lied to and our kids are being lied to. And they need to know the truth. How precious every child is, whether it's in or out of a womb. They need to hear that from you as parents. My wife and I, we had talks with all of our kids between like the ages of eight and 10 years old. We had the talk, right? You know what I'm talking about? We started that conversation young with our kids because in this day and age, we didn't know where they were going to hear it. And we wanted them to hear a godly perspective from us first. Have real, meaningful, godly conversations with your kids, with your family, with everyone around you. It starts at home. We're called to be people who are in this battle 
And we have to recognize that our, our power comes from God, our battle plans need to come from God, and that we have to start at home. Every time I, I speak, I like to give three take-homes so that this week you won't forget about me. So that this week as you're sitting in your house, you have something to think back through. And so I want to leave you with three take-homes today. They're going to be on the screen. Number one, where is your Gideon's wine press? Reflect on where, where you find yourself hiding due to fear or feeling of inadequacy. How can you step out on faith, trusting in God's strength, trusting that his strength is perfect in your weakness? Number two, how are you balancing truth and love in your interactions? Do you lean more towards, towards harsh truth or permissive love? And how can you adjust to speak the truth in love more effectively to those around you. Number three, last one. What idols do you need to tear down at home? Identify anything that might be taking precedence over your relationship with God or undermining your spiritual authority at home. What steps, make small practical steps, what steps can you take this week to begin removing them. Let's pray. Father, we are in a battle, and Lord, we need you. <laughs> we need your strength. We need your direction. Father, help us to be people who take a stand for you in love and truth. Help us to be people who pour into our kids, to other kids around us, who, who, who share your message so that they won't be pulled away by lies. Help us to not be, be blinded to the lies of the world around us, Lord, but help us to be boldly and lovingly speak the truth to others. In your name I pray, amen. Wow, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.